we've, we've touched on, on many important points with you. We had some great points that were there this morning. Some of the discussions I overheard during the break today is like, oh, this is all great, but I, I don't, I personally, I cannot change all of that in my company. What is it that I can do? And how do I get those that could do and should do to do what we want them to do? Hmm. <laughs> One large bank I did some work in had been trying to transform to Agile stuff for a, a number of times, probably nine or ten years. And one thing I always do is start with where I am and who around me wants more or less a, a pull-based model. So trying to help this organization you know, visualize work, coordinate efforts between different teams, I start from myself and put my own personal Kanban board up, usually in very bright sticky. So people walking around, they see it in this, the sea of beige that is most corporations. And the people that come by and ask are people I refer to as the movers. Those are the people that, hey, what is that? What do you use it for? Oh, here's what I use it for. It's so I can understand uh, requests and demand for my time. It helps me plan a little bit better. And they go, oh, can you help us with this over here? One simple interaction, and then usually the, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit. Another team will now ask that team. So instead of coming to the agile coach or the perceived outside expert, it becomes a case of, oh, I saw you got it to work in this organization. Can you come show our team how to do it? And creates more of a social atmosphere. Versus, OK, we're all going to learn this new way of managing work. So you three are going to have to come into our planning session. And we're going to train you on these ideas. Uh, and now your KPIs are how many sticky notes you put on the wall and push-based. Uh, provide the opportunity and make it pull-based is what I prefer. Interesting approach. Thank you. Damien, what do you suggest? Um, I, well, I see a couple of, um, so I normally use, um, when I'm working with leaders, I always say, don't have a one-size-fits-all approach, which sounds very uh, evident, but then they say, well, what do you mean by that? And I say, there's a really great model used by a psychiatrist, a guy called David Cantor. Uh, he's a New York-based psychiatrist, and where a lot of people um, know of his work as opposed to him is, do you ever remember the TV show Sex in the City? the series. Well, Sex in the City was devised using David Cantor's model of understanding group dynamics. So the four main women characters were based on his archetypes. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to introduce that to leaders and say, this stops this one-size-fits-all level of engagement. So he divides... So when you look at any group, this isn't to stereotype because his point he makes is facts will shift your position. So when you think about your family, you might be debating where you're going on vacation and you might be in one position. Then you may debate where you're going to go this weekend and you might adopt a, a different role because the fact changes your role. But the four main roles that he identifies in any group are you have some people that are initiators. These are people that have got the ideas and they love it and they build on it and they're enthusiastic. Another group of people that we then have are the blockers, the organisational cynics. These are the ones that will resist it and tell you why they've seen this before and it didn't work then, won't work now. Now, traditionally, most organisations, it's that, th those two levels of binary groups. You're, we talk about energy sappers, energizers, mood hoovers, radiators, things like that. And the reality is it's an unhelpful narrative. There's two other groups that are there. You have some people that are detached. They just don't care. They're not engaged. And the, the issue doesn't affect them. They don't want to engage. But then the fourth group are your adapters. They can adapt depending on who the, who the, who the guiding coalition is. So the question is, when you communicate... I hear so many people that try and roll out an initiative and they come out and you say, what do you think? And they go, and they don't like it. When the reality is they're just describing what the blockers have fed back on them. What, what they haven't understood is, what did the detached, what did the adapters and what did the initiators think? And the reality is they don't know because they haven't engaged them. So when you can introduce this model, I find it's a great way of trying to engage because you have to be able to answer what all four groups do. So a nice way that I use it with some teams is share it before you're ever sharing an idea. Get the language understood. And then you can manage a room at any stage. You can ask people to play the part of, say, you be the blocker, you be the initiator, and you be the adapter. So that way it means that everybody gets heard without feeling that one particular group 
uh, are more dominant than any other. I am um, I'm not the professional in HR, but I visited quite, visited quite a lot of members over the last year since I took on uh, responsibility at Swiss ICT. And I had a very nice story of one of the big companies in Switzerland, which was around security, so not classic, sec not IT security, but security in general. Mm -hmm. And they actually had a problem, or actually had a project of um, replacing their whole IT infrastructure for the, for the users. So the standard rollout, new, new desktops. And when the IT head actually was looking for a project manager, everybody said, no, I don't want to do that job, I don't want to do that job. It's too risky, we know security, too many people, the only thing I can do, lose. There's only one bet is not to fulfill the project. And that was actually a young project manager who said, listen, I'll take that job if I get the possibility to actually do it in an agile way. I tried to do something different, knowing that all the in past years, all the projects that have succeeded in the same way actually failed. And it was a big challenge for that company because so far, security, everybody wants to be everything closely controlled, and for HR, for them, was kind of there's no way. But there was no other person at hand. And um, the CIO actually told me it was for him, it was. For nine months, it was the most freakiest project because the project manager always told him, I can't give you a plan, but I know we're going to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, don't make a long story here. At the end, the project finished in time, in budget, full, flux, full functionality. And what the CEO actually learned is that was a great proof for us, for the organization, to learn that there are other ways to do projects than we did in the past. HR, for them now, it's one of the um, t technologies that they use, actually, in the project approach. And so you ask the question, how can we do that? Use a project that actually can prove that with a different approach, like with HR, you actually can make things done that don't work otherwise. So seize the opportunity of a seize project the that is there, and then take it from there to educate the rest of the company. This is a similar approach to, to what you've suggested, and also includes what, what, what you just said. Um, where, where are we at in Switzerland right now? I mean, that's the... That's the big question that everyone wants to know. Like, where are we at from your perspective, Christian? Um, we, we had discussed it a little bit up front already. So the question is always, are we also 10 years behind like everybody else in Europe back in the things they are? Well, the good point is um, we started 10 years ago with our first LES conference, so we can't be 10 years behind. Um, but you know Swiss people normally on the way that um, we wait until something is really bulletproof until, until we start. Uh, but then actually when we stop, we do it really well. So I think we are, from my perspective, I compare what, what the feedback I get from other countries with other people I interact, I think we are not the top leaders, we are very good followers and what we do is really good. What specifically do we do, just for the two of them to understand and reflect upon this briefly, what do we do and where do our companies and organizations stand? We're skipping the international yeah. global comparison there, but where do companies stand? The challenge I think the companies are confronting with is Switzerland in an international base is seen as a very secure country. And so what people expect from us is to be in a project and also from a project methodology to be very safe and very, um, very, very guaranteed that we succeed. I think from that point, um, you cannot say there's Switzerland in a whole, overall. overall. Mm -hmm. I think there are the small companies, the young companies that I think have very well adopted, at least what I see, perhaps a little bit influenced because we work so closely with our LAS. Uh, team here in, in, in the, our, our association. But what I think is good is that we see big companies adopting now agile technology, not only the one that I mentioned, but also like the AXA insurance that actually made a speech here as well that tries to identify which are the areas that we can apply to. I think um, from that perspective, we are in good shape. What we're doing is on a, on a small companies, I think the, the, the message to, to do things differently, work in an agile way, is now widespread. For the big companies, it's still a learning curve, beginning of the learning curve, and I think that's where the big companies can learn from the smaller companies. Do you have the, um, the, the impression there was, there was some criticism uh, this morning on Twitter saying, oh, being agile is, is about is the, like the Me Too movement, right? So we all want to be agile, and we're technically uh, abusing the word agile for marketing purposes instead of or well, even for HR marketing purposes, instead of actually doing something within companies? What's, what's sort of the, the feeling you have if you look at companies globally? Is, is Agile a marketing trend, communications trend, or is it actually being done? And to what degree? I find companies that I visit that are not being public and telling their stories are getting it. 
So sometimes, you know, you see some of these case studies and then you talk to people in the company and they go, yeah, it, not, it, none of it works like that. So there is a little bit of cynicism in one sense, but I think overall, it doesn't matter what country or market or region, it's difficult to compare, especially in globalization, one country to another about who's the furthest ahead. I think there are far more micro success stories that pile up to big victories that we just gloss over is more of the trend. We, we still think of the full arc of the transformation and we try to put a binary measurement, success failure on something complex and we lose sight of the thousands of little small success stories that it doesn't matter what country or, or company I've seen. There are lots that are having success with it. So I think having the ability to separate out, knowing that Agile's become a business model for a lot of organizations, um, separate the signal from the noise. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I, 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 my perspective is always to, to be cynical and then be proved otherwise. Because um, I, I go into so many organizations where I see that lack of congruence, they may be paying lip service to it and tick a box, and yet, so similar to what Jace was saying, now you, you scratch deeper, there's no congruence, it's not living uh, other than in the marketing or PR materials. Um, I think there's a lot of organizations that, that are good at paying lip service and marketing it. It's the ones that seem to get on with it quietly where that real congruence exists. Right. I think um, Agile is a victim of its own success. Um, if you look at the whole, what, what happened over the last years, and you had a great chart this morning when you show kind of the top 10 of the Fortune 500 companies in the past, and if you look at what are the most valued companies now, um, so for those who don't know, the big most valued companies right now on the stock markets are all IT companies. So with Apple and Google and so forth, it's not the Ford and, and the Exxons anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think many people understood that they need to be much quicker now and much more going into digital topics. And um, everybody that goes into what do we do have to digital, they understand they have to be quick, they have to be flexible and adoptable, and they have to be agile. So everybody thinks now, and I know, do, do, do you all name the, or the, this, this uh, story of hammer and nail? So if the only tool you have a hammer, don't be surprised if every problem looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So I think everybody tries now to use the HR hammer, hammer to use non-HR problems. And I think that's what's happening right now. And therefore, yes, um, th there's a certain danger that HR is one hand seen as a methodology that helps a lot, that has a lot of success stories, but it can't be used for everything, like you mentioned in this morning. When does it work, when does it not work? Um, so something that was interesting in, in this case was uh, Dave Snowden does a really good talk on apex predator theory. So uh, Agile tends to focus internally and forgets the market that the companies work within sometimes. We get too focused on values, principles, practices. Uh, but today's world, markets change around our companies so often. In his view, apex predator theory is, if you're the dominant predator in the space and suddenly you get attacked from the sides and, and what you do becomes a commodity, an internal focus is less likely to help you survive. Things like, if anyone saw the recent story from Kissmetrics, the founder of Kissmetrics wrote, you know, a really long blog post about why Kissmetrics didn't take over the market. They were five years ahead of web analytics. Um, and he went on with, they, they were kind of, he was kind of taking this chasing cars approach. It'd be a good idea to do this. It'd be a good idea to do that. So the teams were kind of shifting all over the place. Um, but he didn't talk about how analytics became a commodity. They were the only, there was them and Google Analytics back then. Now there's thousands of analytics tools that are out there. So the, the, the continual innovation and competition has increased so much that what we do internally, there's only so much we'll be able to get out of that. And Agile will help in some cases, but it, does, it doesn't help us necessarily adapt to when our product or services become a commodity. Do you mean the hammer and nail principle? Yeah. What, well, what I would say is what get measured is what gets done. So it's that idea that how many organizations do you know that will tell you that people are our most important asset and then when times get tough, what's the first resource they look to go up? The most important asset. So you recognize that I, there's an incongruence somewhere at some level and it's often at the belief level of the organization that are they prepared to invest in this even when it's not um, evident. So. 
a lot of the work I do with teams is um, it's very much around this idea of adversity. How do you respond to moments of adversity when things are not working? Are you robust enough to, to stay true to that? Um, and I think go and look at uh, where it features. So go into any board meeting and find out where it features on the list of discussions or is it put under any other business. Gives you an idea of where the real priority of it lies. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd love to add, um, we, we, we said that we want as much practical transfer, as much of your insights and stories. That's what we really want to hear today. I've asked you all to, to pick a story that truly inspired you from a company or a case that you worked with. Would you like to share those stories with us? Sure. Please go ahead. Uh, my favorite one, I guess, is uh, some of the examples that I gave this morning was in this organization. If you remember when the Panama Paper scandal happened? Um, in this particular bank, the, it was within the first 100 days of this CEO. And as the story goes, his mom called him and said, you're not one of those guys, are you? So you talk about head or heart, heart <laughs> yeah. and mind. There's the heart. Uh, so head, heart, wallet. Wallet, they invested 1 billion euros in a decade-long transformation. And the theory U being the, the, the logic or the, the mantra or the thing they were going to follow. So they had all three of those things in place. They had passion and purpose. They had the money to do it. And they had a very deep transformational approach that they were going to take for it. And coming back every six months into this organization, you know, you come back in and everybody thinks their organization sucks, right? You come in and you go, ah, we've been talking about this forever and nothing ever changes. And I come back six months later and go, holy cow, look at the progress. So, and you can't see it when you're in the system. And this story has gone on for, I think I've been back and forth over three years or so. And there's always, it's leaps and bounds for me, but for them it's, uh, you know, we're still doing this dumb practice. <laughs> they get that chance to have it reflected back. Uh, I could go on with hundreds of stories of pockets in this organization, but head, heart, wallet. They, they attacked this problem from all three angles and the energy and the motivation. Having agile people, uh, they had agile coaches, scrum masters, organizational development people, HR, change managers, consultants, and managers were part of this global uh, change network. Just phenomenal. Loved it. Impressive story. Thank you so much. Um, the example I'd share is um, I, I, I finished some research last year. Um, I spent the last two years back and forth from Catalonia uh, doing some research. It, so I was doing research on um, the topic of uh, organisational culture um, and the publishers had asked me if I'd go and immerse myself at uh, FC Barcelona, the football club. And um, they're an organisation that are fascinating because they've used, they decided that culture could be a competitive advantage in a highly competitive world that they operate in. And they set off down this journey 11 years ago. Um, so what I was looking at was uh, how they've basically built their whole culture around uh, this idea of a commitment culture. And there's a lovely phrase that there's a director there called Cheeky Bagiristain gave me that, because when we first started doing it, people said, is this not an organization where some of the world's best players mm -hmm. exist? And that was my challenge I laid to him. And he gave me what I think is one of the best quotes on, on culture in any context. He said, talent will get you as far as the dressing room door. Your behavior will determine whether we keep you within that dressing room. So your talent is only enough for us to consider allowing you into the organization. Keeping you there depends on how you choose to behave. So the question I asked them was, so what are the behavioral rules? They've got three what they describe as trademark behaviors. And I think they lie at the heart of this whole theme of, of, um, of Agile. The first one is humility. This is what they're demanding from some of the world's most talented players, humility. So they say, don't come into this environment showing off your wealth, your privilege, your status, or successes, because that would indicate that you like humility. If you like humility, you can't learn. If you can't learn, you can't improve. If you can't improve, you've got nothing to offer us. The second one is you invest in your talent, so you work hard. You don't just coast on what you can do or what you know. You come and develop and do more than that. And then the third one is you put the team above your own self-interest. So if there's ever a clash between what's right for you as an individual and what's right for the team, choose the team option. And one of the nice anecdotes they used for that was they employed a guy um, to, to guard the behaviours. So he sits alongside the coaches. And the, uh, the story is that he used to sit on the substitutes bench during games. 
And while the game was taking place, he would sit and watch the guys that hadn't been selected. And what he was observing were who were the guys that were emotionally invested in the team's performance and who were the guys that would sit there trying to have a conversation or chewing gum. Because in those behavioural terms, because you've not been picked, your self-interest overrides what the team are doing. And they would manage you out of the... They gave you a really simple choice. You either fit in or you find a way out. But you don't compromise. We're not compromising the organisation based on how you feel. This is you sign up to all of those cultural rules or none of them. It's just a really powerful example of how, in the 11 years since they've done this, they've gone through a period of success that we almost take for granted today, but it's unprecedented in both their history and in uh, the sport in Spain. Wow, that, that is a truly, truly spectacular story. Christian, quick story from you. Um, I remember well, it was, I think it was the first HR breakfast from the LNS team that actually was visiting uh, when I took over uh, responsibility for Swiss ICT and it was a case of uh, SPV, Swiss Railways. Um, where actually the team doing the IT support actually officially was not allowed to, to go HR, but they, say, they figured out that um, they had no other jobs because they had so many incoming calls and so forth, they had to change. So what they committed as a team is say, we do it internally, we don't communicate, we just do it. They had a team leader that was brave enough to say, okay, if we fail, I take it on my shoulders, so I protect you. And at the end, when they actually succeeded, he said it was the whole team to make it. And I think that was really a great way to show how HR can be introduced into small teams. It needs a team that's supporting it, and it needs great team leaders, actually, that take uh, the burden, actually say, I protect you, and I'll lead you forward. That is truly good leadership. Wonderful. Are there any questions that you would like to ask our panel that we've got up here? Can you ask them? Everyone's going to go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Any, anything that's on your mind? Any comments? Any stories you want to share? Any solutions you want for your own company, for the company that you work for? Yes. It's about the question from Jay, uh, the, the fact from Jason. You, you, you said uh, it's not enough just to have him. Uh, a sense of emergency, we need a purpose. And I've been talking with people, they said uh, without, uh, without emergency you don't do any cha change. And so maybe we could uh, look at this from the point of, of steps and uh, storytelling, so it doesn't need both probably, yes. <laughs> hmm. The sense of urgency. Hmm. For me, it's more the stress that it creates when you talk about urgency. It, it puts you in a spot of uh, obligation instead of responsibility. This is urgent, we have to. And, and, and that type of language, I think, leads to a different conversation um, if we don't shift it away to uh, a, a, some deeper sense of purpose. So uh, Christopher Avery's re, um, responsibility process talks a lot about that. So there's a problem, uh, and, and we have to fix it. We're, we're in obligation, which is a, a negative response. How do we get to responsibility? How do we get to a different level of conversation? That's why I don't like the term very much. I understand why it's, for me it's, what's the reason for doing this? And do we understand the difference in perspective between the leadership team, management, the people on the teams, the market we serve? It's more complex than to say the urgency is, profits are down and we have to do this. If I'm a developer, how do I rally around that? How do I rally around Oh, so profits are down. You're not going to get 10 million in stock options? Boo-hoo for you. It, it, it becomes, we need a different conversation. We need a different shape than just that have to obligation feeling. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I concur with what Jason just said there. I think, um, I said to you, I see a common mistake that we make is um, we use fear, facts, or force to persuade people to change. And, the, and when you create an emergency, you just uh, you you generate fear in the organisation. Fear is great to run away from something, but what happens when you get far enough away? There's no threat. It's far better to run towards a compelling reason of what what, what we will gain, rather than what we're going to escape from. And I think 
that gives us a more su it's the more sustainable way of doing it. Fear can it provides that short term adrenaline shot, but it's not sustainable over a long term. But it's almost as the story of Nemo. Once upon a time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. It's, 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 everybody knows. Yeah, of course. So, so, but, but there's positive emotions behind it as well. There's excitement. There's curiosity. There's, there's, there's the, the, the positive emotions of what are we going to gain, rather than what we're we not going to lose. So those red emotions can still be used, but harnessed for what we will gain rather than what we will escape. If you apply that as the trigger for the conversation, so using the idea of the hero's journey or you know a storytelling canvas, is it, the, the purpose is developing the story together with people versus I'm the leader and I come up with the story of Nemo and say, here's why. We want to explore that together uh, and honor the past is, the impor is an important part for me with storytelling because our brains are so wired, defined towards, it's like Velcro for negative things and Teflon for positive things. The good things always we slide off and we always attract ourselves to the drama and the bad things. So let's honor the past. Let's, in our storytelling, let's say, you know what, we really kick ass at these three things. Then one day the world changed around us and we need to do something different. And it just really shapes the conversation, I find, in a more positive, positive light. Do you see kind of something with that stickiness of... Yeah, definitely. We, we yeah, yeah. The so, the, so the way we wired, we wired naturally to perceive threat. That red system sees the threat far quicker than it does about being seduced by, by the positive things or all that. Um, I like the phrase I use that you've just described better than what I than what I do. I talk about success leaves clues. So when you start from the idea of when you're good, why are you good? And that's seductive in many ways because everyone's got an opinion on it, but you need to generate the time to say what are we good at. So I, I'll give you an example. I did some work out in Australia last year with the team, a sports team, and the co they'd underperformed, and the coach said, "Oh, can you come and work with them and tell them how they need to improve?" And I went. We're just going to, you're setting this up for the worst week of all our lives. And he said, why? I said, because I'll walk in the room and say to these guys, this is what you haven't done well, this is what you need to do better. And the first thing they will do is shoot the messenger. They will say to him, who are you? You're an English guy, you've never played the sport, you're coming out like that. So I said, so it'll be a really uncomfortable week for everyone and the benefits will be negligible. He said, how do you do it? I said, my suggestion would be, let's go and seduce these guys. Let's spend the first two days asking them, why are they good? When you're excellent, why are you excellent? And, and they guarantee everyone's got an opinion on that. Everyone's got wants to share. The level of debate is healthy and great. And then you establish the standards. Then you say, right, so how do we compare at the moment? They recognise the gap. And they've, they're willing to, to bridge it rather than me going in and p pointing out their flaws and asking them how they're going to do it. It's, just a, it's the same conversation. He just gets it. Like, think about it in sort of the corporate world. How many people produce absence reports when it comes to staff? And you say, why don't you produce attendance reports instead? So what would you rather work on, reducing absence from 5 to 4 percent or driving attendance from 95 to 96 percent? So it's the same problem, but how you choose to approach it generates a very different response. Wonderful. I'd love to thank the three of you for your openness and uh, for the debates up here, for mm -hmm. the quick debates, the agreement, and for answering some of the challenging questions as well that came from the audience. Oh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being in uh, Zurich. And a huge round of applause for the three of you.